Hey there, creative coders. This is Benjamin D. Whiting, and welcome back to the Super Collider segment of Null State's interactive digital art tutorial series. Last week, we talked about passing values into Super Collider class files in order to set parameters like frequency and amplitude of audio unit generators, in addition to touching on interpreter and environmental variables. This week, we'll be discussing the use of local variables and sound generating functions to facilitate more complex sound design possibilities, as well as touching upon the difference between the audio rate and control rate class methods. Let's get started. While we have been storing our sound generating functions into globally referenceable vessels, they are not a good choice for the majority of use cases for variables. Most often, we want to store some data or value to be referenced and possibly altered within a function or block of code that cannot be accessed or unwittingly overwritten by other unrelated code. Thankfully, local variables are here to save the day. Just like with their more globally oriented brethren, Local variables act as containers for data, be they simple numbers, functions, sound generating and otherwise, or anything else. Their contents can be referenced throughout the function or other kind of code block to which they're assigned, and any embedded function or other code can freely reference or inherit these variables. The ability to reference and modify this data make local variables indispensable tools when formulating code more complex than indefinitely outputting a single sign tone. What cannot be achieved is unrelated code being able to access these variables, thus ensuring the integrity of the data in question against accidental, or possibly even malicious, alteration. Unlike what we saw with SuperCollider's approach to global variables, Local variables are only available in one flavor, and their method of initialization and use are refreshingly consistent. If you recall from last week's episode, interpreter variables are initialized upon booting SuperCollider, so they are ready to be used right out of the gate. This is not the case with local variables. Before one can make use of a local variable, one must declare it by using something called a var tag. Those of you familiar with languages like JavaScript may already be familiar with this tag. However, unlike in JavaScript, these declarations must precede all other code in code blocks. There is one exception with regard to functions that will be unveiled next episode. Let's go ahead and boot the server now. So let's say we want to synthesize a 100 Hz pulse waveform. Now, unlike a sinusoidal waveform, pulse waves oscillate between values of zero or off and one or on. This causes their waveform to have an almost vertical rectangular slope. They produce a rather distinctive sound when audiated and their harmonic content can be altered by adjusting what's known as their duty cycle or the fraction of a period in which the signal is on. Let's take a quick listen, making use of the non-band limited form of the wave. I shall use the argument tags here for sake of clarity, though it is absolutely not required in this case. By the way, if you were wondering how I was able to add these tags so fast, one can quickly insert and cycle through the available argument tags for any given class method by invoking the tab key while typing. A neat alternative to the dot play instance method of function is dot scope. Dot scope audiates a sound generating function just like dot play does, but adds an oscilloscope display so one can see the resulting waveform in action. For reference, here is our beloved 440 hertz sign tone. And now, our 100 hertz pulse wave with a 50% duty cycle oscillating at 10% amplitude, to go easy on our ears. Notice how the pulse wave doesn't dip below zero like the sinusoidal wave does? Interesting, right? This, along with its almost completely vertical slope, makes pulse waves great choices for triggers. In case you're wondering, the first argument of dot scope is the number of channels to display, 
and while we could have stuck with the default of 2, since the right channel is but a carbon copy of the left, I feel it's simpler to restrict it to 1 for now. As pulse waves are psychoacoustically reflexive, waves with duty cycles above 50% sound the same as those with duty cycles less than 50% by the same amount. To demonstrate, let's compare a pulse wave with a duty cycle of 25%, in which the signal is on for 25% of each period and off for 75%. To one with a cycle of 75%, where the signal is on for 75% of each period and off for 25%. Visually we can see a difference, but sonically we can't detect one at all. This ties into why the add argument in oscillators is typically useless for audiated waveforms. We, as human beings, can't detect phase or offset unless paired with another identical, albeit phase-shifted signal. So the ratio of the signal being on to off controls the timbre of the resulting waveform, with its reciprocal exhibiting identical timbral characteristics. Okay, back on track. This is all well and good, but let's say we want to engage in pulse width modulation and have a triangle wave control the width of the pulse wave as a low frequency oscillator. You know, classic voltage controlled synthesis stuff. The simplest way would be to embed a triangle wave oscillator within the width argument of lfpulse.ar. So here we have a non-band-limited triangle wave generator, oscillating at 0.2 Hz, controlling the width argument of our non-band-limited pulse wave generator. By the way, this is a prime example of the add argument in action. Triangle wave eugens, like sinusoidal wave eugens, oscillate between values of negative 1 and 1 by default. What we want instead is to have it oscillate between 0 and 1. How this is achieved is by multiplying the resulting values by 0.5, thus resulting in a window of negative 0.5 to 0.5, and finally adding 0.5 to the final value, giving us a window of 0 to 1. However, while this is currently still plenty readable, what if we wanted to control the frequency of the triangle wave by a low frequency sawtooth wave, oscillating at one cycle every three seconds? It's still possible to make sense of it, but as I'm sure you're catching on, things can get out of hand really quickly by shoving everything into one lengthy instruction. This is where local variables come in handy. We can compartmentalize each of these LFO eugens into their own variable, thus leading to better organized and legible code. We begin our function by declaring two variables, LFO1 and LFO2, each separated by a comma. These two designations are now available for use within the function to store desired data. Naming conventions for local variables are identical to environmental variables save the latter's prepended tilde, which is not allowed here. One must begin a local variable with a lowercase letter, but any alphanumeric character and most special characters after that point are fair game, so long as there isn't any interior white space. Furthermore, we must move from the inside out with regard to our nested LFOs, as the relevant variable controlling some parameter in a UGen has to have something set to it first before it can be used. So we set our LFSAW UGen, the deepest nested LFO in our chain, to LFO1, while LFTRY is placed into LFO2. We then reference LFO2 in the LFPulse UGen our outermost eugen in the chain, and the one that's actually being sounded. Now, we could leave our code like this, and some of you may prefer assigning each of our nested low-frequency oscillators to their own variables. However, the beauty of variables in SuperCollider, much like in most programming languages, is that they can refer to themselves recursively. Therefore, one can set up a chain of variable transformations utilizing only one variable throughout the chain. Let's test this via the following. Here we're declaring only one variable, that being LFO. 
We are setting it to our nested sawtooth wave low frequency oscillator, just like before, but then we're setting it once more to our triangle wave oscillator, referencing the previous state of the variable LFO in its frequency argument. Since we're dealing with nested eugens, one can absolutely point the variable LFO to each successive outer layer of our Matryoshka doll, as we no longer need it for the interior layers. They've already been dealt with. This method of chaining cuts down on local variable clutter and is particularly convenient once we start dealing with spectral synthesis via fast Fourier transforms. One has the option of reducing their lines of code further by combining the variable declaration with its initial value set. This is a handy convention I frequently use in my own code. That said, for the purposes of this tutorial series, I will continue separating the declaration and initialization instructions of our local variables, as I find that approach pedagogically satisfying, producing the clearest possible code. Finally, you might be wondering, but Benjamin, why is it that only the LF pulse eugen is being sounded when we have three audio rate eugens being used in our function? The answer to that is twofold. First, and most obvious, our LFOs produce waveforms at frequencies far below a human being's threshold of hearing. We wouldn't be hearing them anyway. The second reason has to do with how sound generating functions are parsed by SuperCollider. Let's try upping the frequency of our sawtooth wave generator to something within our range of hearing. In spite of this, no 33 Hz sawtooth wave can be heard anywhere. What gives? This is because the final instruction in a sound generating function is what is piped to the default audio bus. Up until this point, we've only dealt with functions containing one instruction, but in instances where you're creating a function multiple instructions long, you must ensure that the last instruction consists of what you want to be heard. For instance, listen to what happens when we append this familiar code to the end of the function. What happened to our pulse wave? Well, even though we went through the trouble of setting up our nested LFOs, piping them into our 100 Hz pulse wave, we decided instead to end the function with the instruction telling SuperCollider to output two channels of a 440 Hz sine wave, so that's precisely what we hear. We don't hear a mixture of both. Up until now, we've been instancing all of our oscillator eugens at the audio rate with the class method .ar. This means that their resulting waveforms are being sampled at whatever sampling rate the SuperCollider server is set to. In my case, it's set to 44,100 Hz, though 48,000 Hz is another commonly used sample rate that I switch to from time to time depending on my needs. Humans typically have a range of hearing between 20 and 20,000 Hz, but in order to properly reproduce this range of frequencies, we need to supply two samples for each of these cycles per second. This is because acoustic waves undergo both compression and rarefaction. Ever wonder why representations of audio waveforms in DAWs like Audacity show activity both above and below the x-axis? This is why. This is what's known as the Nyquist theorem. A link to the relevant Wikipedia article can be found in the description below. As such, we need to stream any eugen we eventually want to audiate at a sampling rate of at least 40 kHz. On the other hand, low frequency oscillators, or LFOs, don't need to be sampled at a rate anywhere near 40 kHz, as their output isn't intended to be heard. They are being used to control other oscillators after all. SuperCollider often gives a choice of sampling rate class methods for its oscillator eugens, .ar, or audio rate, and .kr, or control rate. .ar, as mentioned above, uses the sampling rate of the server. This means that whatever data is generated by a given eugen instance with .ar, it will provide the server with however many data points corresponding to the server sampling rate every second for accurate sound reproduction. .kr is instead set to 1 64th of the audio sampling rate. Therefore, given a sampling rate of 44,100 Hz, any eugen instanced at the control rate will be sampled at a rate of 689 cycles per second. If your audio hardware is instead set to 48,000 Hz, then SuperCollider would have booted the server to that sampling rate instead, in which case the control rate would be 750 cycles per second. 
Using the .kr counterpart for any controlling low-frequency oscillator is highly recommended, as it significantly cuts down on CPU usage that is otherwise being wasted. Let's return to our tilde pulse sound generating function. First, take a look at the bottom right of the IDE, where the server status widget can be found. See that number 6 next to the U? This means that there are currently 6 UGENs running. This is because the oscilloscope view invokes 6 to remain active, so we'll close that and swap dot .scope back out for dot .play in order to facilitate our demonstration. Keep a close eye on the server widget while this process is running. As you can see, this process invokes 14 UGENs. This number includes the necessary unit generators for each of the LFOs, along with the main pulse wave, which is double, thus requiring two, as well as all of the necessary busing and monitoring UGENs at work behind the scenes that allow for us to hear the sound. The two percentages to the left of this number measure, from left to right, average CPU usage and peak CPU usage. Now, let's swap out the .ar in both of our LFOs for .kr. The number of UGENs used and resulting sound quality are identical in both cases, but the CPU usage has gone down a bit. Of course, we're talking about only a tenth of a percentage here. That said, I am running this on an Intel Xeon E5462, and even at that, these savings add up, especially when dealing with more processor-intensive tasks on a larger scale. Next episode, I have planned an exciting demonstration of such a savings, but it requires syntax that we haven't gone over yet. Okay, this about wraps it up for our episode on local variables in SuperCollider, along with a brief explanation of the difference between audio and control sampling rates. Next week, we'll be discussing the creation of arguments to use in our own functions that will allow external manipulation of our synthesized sounds, as well as one of the most useful, fundamental features in a text-based programming language, iteration. In the meantime, please don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to this channel to show your support for more interactive digital music and art content from us at Null State. Also, make sure to check out our Facebook page and webpage to stay up to date on all of our upcoming events, workshops, and concerts. Links to both being in the description below. See you next time!